course. Thank you very much all for coming. Um, in case you don't know, we're the Cornwall Science Community. We run events like these Cafe Size. We've done a lot online over the past, well, COVID years. Um, today we've got um, the West Country Rivers Trust here to give a short talk. Before we get into this, uh, you might be wondering why I'm holding this dog. Um, we are doing this hybrid, so we've got um, some folks online and we record these things as well. So we're going to have a recording of the audio and the presentation. Um, no one's on camera except our local speakers. Uh, just so you know, for the Q&A later, I will ask you to pass around this dog as a mic clipped onto his little uh, ear, just so people online can hear you as well. If you prefer your recording not to be on YouTube afterwards, just come up to me or Matt and let us know afterwards and we can cut that out as well. So there's absolutely no pressure here whatsoever. Great, I'm gonna get my notes back again. So the way this works, we're gonna have a presentation from Haley and Jack uh, first, and then we're gonna do a Q&A session afterwards, uh, which again, I'll moderate, so uh, no worries there. Um, so Haley is the um, events officer for West Country Rivers Trust. Um, she's uh, done a master's in conservation and biodiversity on campus here beforehand. Uh, and Jack, who will be speaking later, is the Citizen Science Coordinator for the West Country Rivers Trust. And his background comes from Surface Against Sewage and working for them for 10 years. Um, fantastic. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Hayley then. Hi, I'm Hayley. Um, thank you guys for coming. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of our charity before. Many of you might have just seen that there was a talk on river health and the state of our rivers, which is really topical at the moment, uh, which is great. It's been gaining attention recently due to pollution events and such. But some of you might not know who we are. So I'm going to start off by giving you a quick overview of what we do, what our charity aims are, and then give some highlights of projects that we have happening in Cornwall at the moment. And then I'm going to hand over to Jack. He's going to talk a little bit more specifically about one particular project, which is our CSI Citizen Science Investigation Project, where they do lots of uh, water quality testing across the county and talk about some of the results that they've seen so far. So the West Country Rivers Trust was born in 1994, like me. So it's going to be 30 next year. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, it started off just a few kind of passionate individuals who were really concerned about the state of their rivers and they noticed that the fish stocks were declining. So they started this organisation and since then it's grown dramatically. We have over 80 members of staff now. So we have data analysts, we have uh, monitoring experts, we have scientists, ecologists, land advisors, comms and marketing, finance, admin. It's a big organisation now and it means that we can complete a vast array of projects over quite a wide area. And everything we do is informed by science and we take an ecosystems approach. So that means that we consider the function of everything within the catchment, not just the river flowing within it. And for those who don't know, a catchment is the whole area. So if there was rainfall, anything in that area would flow into a particular river and that becomes its catchment. So, of course, that then concerns all the land and communities that surround the rivers as well. And they thought by taking this approach, lots of people can benefit and lots of people can realise that healthy rivers can benefit their health, their livelihoods and lots of other areas of life other than just the river itself. So me measures to protect rivers can actually help save money for farmers. It can help lower costs for water companies, boost tourism and reduce the need to dredge our estuaries and even benefit human health, which takes me on to my next slide. Uh, so the main aims of the trust, first and foremost, is, of course, to create, uh, protect and restore and create healthy rivers. And as as we do this, it has benefits for other areas. So mainly climate resilience, improved biodiversity and human health and livelihoods. And I really do believe that these benefits flow both ways. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this as we go further into the presentation. Uh, so where do we work? We, work? we work all across the West Country. Uh, so that's Devon, Cornwall, Somerset, all the way up to the border um, of East Dorset. And the main rivers that we work on within Cornwall are the River Fowl, the Camel, the Foy, Hale, Parr, St Austell and Carhays. I don't know how you say that one. Um, but they're the main ones that we uh, currently have projects on or have had projects on recently. So our freshwater ecosystems are in crisis and actually just 14% of English waterways are considered in good ecological state. So we complete a lot of different type of work to rectify this and to improve those conditions. So we do river restoration activity such as uh, water quality monitoring. We do nature, we uh, supply nature-based solution ideas for problems, uh, natural flood management, habitat restoration, 
uh, weir removal, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Um, and we do land-based stuff, so some soil health monitoring, woodland creation. So in some cases, if you plant trees in the right places alongside rivers, that can reduce the runoff into rivers from the land. So things like that are really important that you might not immediately think about. Um, Climate-friendly gardening advice, which I'm also going to touch on a bit more. Um, we work with businesses as well. So we do things like plastic waste audits. So we help give businesses ideas of how they can reduce their plastic waste. Um, lots of community engagement like this um, and to do with many of the topics I've already covered. Some examples are we do litter picks, so we do that with schools or communities along riverways, clean them up. Um, outfall safaris, which sounds a bit more exotic than he actually is, but uh, you end up going down rivers. It's really important work. It's where you survey the water that's being discharged from surface water outfall pipes to identify sources of pollution or misconnections in the piping there. And from there, we can take the necessary actions to reduce that and make sure that any water going into our rivers is treated and as clean as possible. Um, and then lots of education as well. So they're just some of the things. And um, I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about a few projects related to some of these that are happening or have happened very recently um, within the county. Um, okay, so this is one of the projects. Uh, so one of the biggest threats to freshwater fish in our rivers is unsuitable ha habitat, which limits migration to feeding grounds. And that's uh, where this project comes in, Water for Growth. It has recently finished in Cornwall and it was based on the Camel and the Foy rivers down here. Um, so it's so yeah, the aims of the project were to improve, improve upstream and downstream fish passage, to improve river and bankside habitat, improve spawning habitat, and to increase numbers of juvenile salmon and sea trout. So it was focused on uh, Atlantic salmon and sea trout, which are anadromous fish, which means that they migrate from the sea upstream um, to spawning habitat along the river um, to breed and to lay their eggs. So. Um, yeah, they have amazing migration journeys. So they start, they're born in rivers, they go down to the sea where there's a much more rich, uh, diverse selection of food. They can grow, get really big, and then they actually go right back to their native river. So they go back to the river where they were born, sometimes even that exact stretch of river. Um, and then that's where they uh, spawn up there. But unfortunately, there's now lots of obstructions and barriers stopping them from getting to these really ideal, optimal spawning habitats. And uh, one of the biggest ones is lots of weirs, which are just small dams. And um, they've been put in for various reasons, but it's to, of course, create kind of still body of water at the top for boats or uh, energy or whatever it may be. But it does stop the fish from making that route up. And when the weirs were installed, it was... Um, not so much of a problem because the fish stocks were really good and the populations were large and they didn't really notice it making too much of a difference. But now that the um, populations have declined massively, it is causing kind of a bit of a worrying effect on those populations. So we do need to start doing something about it. So um, in an ideal world, we would just completely get rid of those weirs, but they um, are kind of uh, privately owned a lot of the time and also still uh, serving some industrial purpose a lot of the time. So it's not as easy as that to just get rid of them. So instead we'll partially remove them or alter them uh, as best we can. Um, now this one is a weir in the center of Camelford town and it was um, impossible. Uh, we couldn't remove it due to its placement being upstream of a major bridge and a drainage infrastructure running through the weir itself. So we did uh, gain permission to add this bafflement uh, baffle easement, sorry, uh, which looks like steps there, but there's actually, when there's no water in there, just like loads of little walls. And it means that there's a deeper, it creates a deeper, deeper water for the fish to um, jump up. And also it slows the flow. And then as you can see up the diagonal there, there is kind of notches within those walls. So it helps um, the fish pass. So we did lots of work like that. And then once they get up into the spawning habitat, we want to make sure that's optimal as well. So we do things like making sure there's clean gravel beds, um, oxidizing vegetation and perfect temperatures for breeding as well. Um, and all of these works are completed in the hope of improving natural capital. So uh, that's where the growth part in the water for growth comes from. So before this project, they noticed there was definitely low fish stocks and angling and the economic input uh, that it brings to local enterprises has fallen. So the idea is that by improving this natural capital, people will learn how to exploit it sustainably and um, 
responsibly and then it kind of brings benefits in all areas and that's what I'm talking about it kind of flowing both ways when people realize that the uh, river and a healthy river with great habitat and a biodiverse um, wildlife um, they realize that can help with their income then they're willing to give back and keep the river healthy themselves. Um, I'm going to move on to a land-based project now. So the founders of our charities believe that if you look after the land, the river will look after itself. And one land management project that we're really heavily involved with is Farm Net Zero. So the project was actually created by another organization called Farm Carbon Toolkit, but we're heavily involved and we kind of lead on the citizen science aspects of the project. So as the name suggests, um, it's about getting farms to net zero. And we work with lots of different farms across Cornwall. So there's uh, three demo farms um, and their uh, aim is to become net zero by the end of the project. So they're trying new innovative, innovative approaches to making sure that um, they're reducing their carbon emissions as best they can. And then we have 40 um, monitor farms which aren't gonna reach net zero by the end of the project, but they do um, still look after their soil health and we're still experimenting on their land and seeing what we can learn and then us at the west country rivers trust we take over the citizen science aspect of it which is taking the lessons learned from these farms out to communities because not a lot of people have farms but a lot of people do have gardens and a lot of people have like plots of allotments and they don't think they realize how much of a difference they can make um, by using climate friendly gardening practices and a lot of people think they're doing and have really good intentions and think they're uh, looking after their garden in a way that's really eco and great but they might be doing small things that is actually releasing a lot of carbon not realizing it and uh, recent studies have found that I think it's one billion acres of uh, land in England um, is actually people's gardens so we can actually make a massive difference if we start implementing these small changes ourselves and it's about empowering communities to realize they can make that change all on their own um, so yeah, we run lots of different workshops focused on measuring soil health, composting, no dig gardening and green manure, creating ponds and rain gardens and on forest gardens as well. And uh, we used to just be able to work in the East, in East Cornwall, but funding has now allowed that we uh, come down more West. So we did a um, workshop recently on no dig at the community roots allotment uh, in, near Eco Park, if anyone knows there. And the Real Food Garden in Bodmin, we did a uh, Ponds and Rain Gardens one. And we have an exciting one coming up, which is this one, um, which is Forest Gardening and Agroforestry, just been confirmed, happening at Loveland on the 12th of June. Um, and that's just in Penryn. So if you are interested in learning a little bit more about that, they're really nice community sessions and you should come along. Um, and here's some pledge cards that people write um, at the end of the sessions. Uh, the workshops that we hold because they pledge to make a positive change for the future and hopefully implement that into their practice uh, so they've said things like add more organic matter um, organize our compost heaps be more effective we have children come along create a rainwater box to water our garden continue to educate myself forever I like that one but um, yeah so really positive feedback from these workshops but you might be thinking what is this to do with rivers but actually it's everything to do with rivers uh, so first off any harmful chemicals you're using um, when you're growing crops like uh, pesticides or fertilizers, when heavy rainfall, they're gonna go straight into the river and they're really harmful. And Jack's gonna talk a little bit about those chemicals um, when I pass over to him as well. Um, also really healthy soils, they can filter the water. So by the time it reaches the river, it'll be a lot purer and cleaner and have less sediment in and such um, than it would otherwise. Also healthier soils are more absorbent. So any rainfall will be um, yeah, better absorbed and less uh, flood risk. And aside from all of that, soils actually contain four times as much carbon as vegetation, um, which is quite impressive because lots of people are, of course, as they should be concerned about um, the trees, that, uh, the carbon that our trees store, but soil is actually four times more than that. So it's a really important project and it has great benefits for our rivers as well. Um, and then moving on to engagement and education, which is the other kind of big one that we cover. Um, and that's going to be mainly taken over by Jack here. He's going to talk about citizen science investigation, which is probably the biggest thing we do, which involves um, getting everyone involved in helping us collect data and making a difference. 
but I also just want to quickly touch on our project Homing In on Rivers, uh, which was our campaign last year. We had a big green match fund where everything uh, we raised in a week was doubled by another organisation. We raised five grand and uh, it was focused on improving wildlife habitat along rivers. And as a result of that, in the next couple months, we're going to have a wildlife refuge that's been made along the river fowl. Don't know exactly where yet, but it's going to be an otter hole and probably some bird boxes, bat boxes. I'm not sure exactly. But if you, um, yeah, check us out on social media, uh, we'll have some updates on that soon. And we're hoping to work again with the Cornwall Science community and do a bit of a site visit or something more outdoorsy with that. But yes, yeah, so and I'm going to pass over to Jack, who's going to tell you a bit more about our citizen science investigation. Awesome, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Jack, um, and as Hayley said, I'm the Citizen Science uh, Coordinator at West Country Rivers Trust, uh, which means I have the very great pleasure of running one of our, our course of volunteer campaigns, which is the Citizen Science Investigations, or CSI. Um, to make my job a lot easier, we actually made a film about it. Um, so rather than me talking, we're going to watch the film. I am on the film, so there's a bit of me talking. Um, but yeah, I'll play this first, and then I've got a few slides afterwards. If I press slide forward again, is it? The freshwater habitats of the West Country need our help. Whether it's due to climate change, sewage pollution, soil runoff and many other challenges, we must stand up for the health of our rivers. And connecting in our communities is one way that we can do this. So I'm here to meet the West Country Rivers Trust Citizen Science and Volunteer Coordinator Jack Middleton to hear more about their volunteer project, the West Country Citizen Science Investigations. Can you tell me a little bit more about what the West Country Rivers Trust Citizen Science Investigation involves? CSI, or Citizen Science Investigations, is one of our volunteer-led programmes at West Country Rivers Trust. Um, and at the moment, we've got just over 370 active volunteers out across the West Country who go out once a month to measure four or five parameters in their local river or stream to give us this incredible data set that will overall tell us the health of rivers, uh, alert us to when something goes wrong, but also build this community of educated, and trained and engaged citizen scientists that we can call on when, well, when we need them. And do people have to have a scientific background to get involved? Absolutely not. So one of the biggest benefits of citizen science is the fact that we train and we give that equipment. All we need is engaged volunteers. We want this programme to be as accessible and inclusive as possible. The equipment is relatively easy to use. We just need as many people as possible to join us. It seems like a really wonderful way for people to feel empowered, to do their part, to be able to do something to protect their local river environment. So how many volunteers do you have so far? So at the moment we have 850 people signed up to the programme. We've got big plans for this, you know, ideally we'd have someone on every important stretch of every water body in the West Country and our kind of target figure for that over the next few years is 4,000. But really this is a programme that has no limit. The more people we have, the, the more data we're collecting, the more we know about our rivers and our overall river health, the better it will be for everyone. So what happens after people have collected this information? Where does the data go? So at the moment, all the data we collect is coming back to West Country Rivers Trust and then we're working on sort of analysing it and turning it from that raw data into information. One of the main ways we do this is by creating scorecards. So a scorecard is kind of the first thing that our volunteers get for all of their hard work. The scorecard is one of the main pieces of information we use to communicate the raw data to the public, but we are also working with organisations like the Environment Agency for greater use of that data, you know, so to use the data coming in to influence where monitoring officers go. It is citizen science data, but it really can direct the more scientific methods to, to find when things go wrong. So why did you want to get involved with the West Country Citizen Science Investigation? Well, I, I, I think it's a really important initiative. I think uh, it's a real great opportunity for 
ordinary folk just to play quite an important role in monitoring what's happening with our rivers and our streams. So often we just think, well, I'm really worried about how our environment is, how, how mucky our rivers are, but I, there's nothing I can do about it. Well, actually you can do quite a lot about it. By getting trained up as a citizen scientist, I'm really hoping that I can uh, contribute towards improving the health of our rivers so that they're in a good state that we pass on to the next generation. Yeah, I surf, I swim, so yeah, pollution is something that I'm very aware of. And yeah, I think being in nature and being outside is so important for not just for our physical health, for our mental health, for our emotional well-being. And it's really important to work towards getting this data so that we can spend that time in those spaces more safely. Yeah, exactly. And as you're saying, it's with that connection, then it kind of fuels us even more to want to do something about yeah. it. It's, it's, it's stewardship. It's about community and it's about stewardship. And it's about linking people with where they live, with the land, with the waters that sustain us. What would you say to encourage people to get involved and how can they sign up? I think just looking at rivers and being out in nature is enough that hopefully drives people to want to protect them and we've made it as easy as possible for people to sign up so they can either go to our website so um, www.wrt.org.uk or email me and the team on csi at wrt.org.uk and one of us will get back to you. Well I really do feel inspired to jump in and get involved because it makes so much sense to just secure healthy water for us and the biodiversity in and around our river environments because these environments really are a life force overall so they need our protection. Awesome, so before I talk a bit more about our CSI program, obviously I've spoken most, mostly about it already, I um, just wanted to give some background. So this is data from Cornwall and Devon and it shows the number of water quality tests the Environment Agency undertook in the year 2000 and then from 2013 to 2020. Um, you've got temperature, conductivity, turbidity, suspended solids and phosphate. And as you can see from 2000 to 2020, the testing has absolutely fallen off a cliff. So we've gone from sort of over 11,000 individual tests for temperature in 2000 to 975 in 2020. Obviously, in 2020, other factors came to play. So you have things like, obviously, the COVID pandemic. But you can see the general trajectory was, um, well, looking pretty horrendous. This then is individual sites. So again, this is, this is uh, public information. It's environment agency information. Um, and it shows the number of ind individual sites that were tested uh, during that time period. So in 2000, we've got 931 individual sites were, were tested for temperature. In 2020, we've got 309. So this data obviously paints a, a pretty sad picture. What it's not supposed to represent is we're, we're, it, we're not just missing these uh, big pollution incidents. What this shows is that we no longer really understand what healthy rivers are. We no longer understand that baseline of what a river or water body should be, um, and therefore when things are going wrong, which is where citizen science comes in. So obviously, I'm sure you've all heard of citizen science. It's already been touted as kind of the key word the environment sector for this year. Um, but basically, it's all about raising awareness on that mass scale. So the data we're collecting might not be as robust um, as the, the test of the environment agency or even our own monitoring teams are collecting, but the sheer scale and the kind of um, regularity of it is what gives it that accuracy. We're providing that better understanding of, of what our rivers should be or re rather what our rivers are at the moment, and then how we can sort of return them to that natural state where they're much healthier. Um, in some instances, we do use the data to alert the authorities. So the more data we're collecting, the more accurate and robust it can be, the more people like Southwest Water and the Environment Agency do pay attention. Um, there's a lot we're working on at the moment around mental health and well-being. So we've all heard of, of blue health. Um, I guess in our case, it's sort of more green and brown health, but. It, it like social prescribers are now prescribing time spent in the environment and, and sort of community volunteering as a means to deal with some of the low level anxieties that we're seeing. And it's all about, you know, reconnecting with the environment, reconnecting with nature and then wanting to do something to better understand and preserve it. And then obviously educating and inform. So we're creating a network of educated, trained, upskilled and equipped citizen scientists across the four counties and potentially nationally that better understand what needs to be done, are catching things and then pollution incidents when they're happening, and then sort of 
educating their community, talking to their children, going into schools and, and, and having that domino effect of, of information. As I, I said on the video, our, our West Country Citizen Science Investigations Programme is all about getting volunteers out once a month to their local water body to test a range of parameters. Um, so we test phosphate and our, the equipment we use is really kind of citizen, the citizen side of citizen science. Um, so we've got phosphate strips and a colorimetric chart to measure phosphate levels. We've got a, a, a total dissolved solids or conductivity meter that also measures um, temperature. And then we have a, I forgot to bring it with me, I'm very sorry, a secchi tube. So a turbidity tube with a secchi disc in the bottom to kind of measure the turbidity of the water. Um, we provide all the equipment and we just ask people to, to go to their local stream or water body uh, and test it once a month. They submit that data through a program that I'll come on to in a bit. And then we use that data to, to influence where our monitoring um, and water quality teams go. We talk to the environment agency, to Southwest Water, to landowners, to councils, to try and use that information to really bring about real tangible change. Um, at the moment, we have, I know on the video I said 375, we're now over 500 volunteers. The video was made in January, so we've gone from 375 to 500 active volunteers in the last few months, which kind of speaks to the, the public appetite and the, the want to protect our rivers more. Um, but again, there's 854 water bodies in the West Country, and we've uh, kind of run an algorithm that says we need just over 4,000 volunteers to cover every important stretch of every water body and give us that sort of full picture of, of river iron health. Um, so this is the program we use to map and to store all of the data. So this is a cartographer. Um, um, if you do sign up to the program, we can log you in. But basically, all of these bots, apart from these two, uh, no idea what those two are, but all those spots are where we're getting data from rivers. Um, and it kind of shows that we've got an amazing spread across Cornwall. Yeah, honestly, no idea. An amazing spread across Cornwall, but there's also these huge gaps that we really do need to fill as well, um, including, obviously, where we are around Falmouth and the Fal. Um, and then when we collect the data after we've got 12 months or, or 12 um, data sets, we then create these scorecards. So the scorecards are kind of a visualization of the data we're collecting, uh, taking that data into information, making it more understandable. So we come up with a health score, like an overall health score for the water body, and it's loosely based on the environment agency and the modeling they do. Um, and then we go through all of the different parameters. So it's a, two pages, and I've only uh, screenshotted one page for this, but we kind of go into more detail around the, the phosphate and how it reacted through the year, total dissolved solids and that sort of thing. Um, one of the other key parts to this isn't so much the phys chem, it's more about the, the kind of the, the um, visual and anecdotal evidence as well. So we're West Country Rivers Trust based in one office in Stoke Climsland. You know, the, the volunteers that we're mobilizing, they're the boots on the ground, they're the ones with that local knowledge that we need. So things like um, the ecology score, uh, volunteers out there, you know, whether they're noticing a drop in fish numbers or birds that they would usually see there or an increase, whether the, there's a local CSO that they're sort of seeing uh, discharging more than Southwest Water are telling us, whether there's a funny smell, whether there's foam. There's a lot of information that only local people know, and that all factors into kind of the overall health and the score that we give to these um, water bodies. This is the closest one that we've got the data on from here. So it's the Swampool stream in both cases. Um, and as you can see, in 2020, it was given, we gave it to B minus. Um, in 2021, it was given a B. And I know for a fact that 2022 results are just out and it's gone up to a B plus. So obviously, that's not necessarily um, because of the citizen scientists, but the fact that we're monitoring, the fact that the data comes to us and then we can, you know, do stuff with it, it has to have influenced that sort of improvement in overall uh, water body health. Um, and then this is a map of the sites across the West Country. So again, we use an ArcGIS program that maps uh, potential sample, points, sample spots on rivers based on uh, population size, the size of the river, accessibility, that sort of thing. The red points are points where we've got someone monitoring, and the blue points are points that are available. Um, so again, it kind of just highlights that we've got amazing coverage and there's incredible people out across the West Country, but also we have a real need for, for more people to join us. Um, the way it works currently is that uh, there's an email address, which I'll come on to in a second. And if you want to sign up to the program, you email us. We then will recommend the closest sample spot to you. But again, using your no local knowledge, what we're really happy to do is kind of work with you to find a better spot. So what we quite often get these days is a, a landowner or a farmer or someone that has a, a river or stream in their garden will come to us. And they'll say, I, I just want to you know, measure upstream and downstream of, of that. Or 
a lot of the time there's a combined sewer overflow that I know is discharging. I want to, you know, I want to do that and I want to find the culprits. Um, so we kind of update this program to find the, the most suitable location for you to monitor. We then have um, a suite of online training resources to kind of bring you up to speed on what we're collecting, why we're collecting it, and also to set expectations. Um, and then we provide you with the equipment free of charge as well. Expectation setting is quite a key part um, with volunteers as a whole, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, and with this specifically, especially with kind of the public appetite at the moment, you know, a lot of people want to test the river, find a pollution incident, find the culprit and sort of immediately slam them on social media and, and get a result. We all, do, we all want, you know, South Asphalt to pay, but it doesn't always work like that. And it's all about collecting months of data to give us that, that really robust data set um, that we can then use to influence, you know, where we send out our monitoring team. We can challenge MPs and councils, that sort of thing. So as much as, you know, we're, we're there to find these issues and to solve them, it's a longer process. It's all about that data. And, and we're much more data driven at, at West Country Rivers Trust than, than other environmental organizations. Awesome. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much to both Haley and Jack. Um, any participants online, just so you know, um, if you've got any questions, please do put them in the chat. Uh, you won't be able to ask them directly, uh, but my glamorous assistant Matt will um, yeah, flag up if there's a question. Um, yeah, as I said earlier, we've got this talking dog. Uh, if you have any questions, um, please let me know, raise your hand, and I will get the dog over to you. While you're all thinking and ruminating, uh, I'm going to kick us off, uh, as always, as is my privilege as a chair, uh, and ask to kind of try and tie this in with the um, sort of uh, Cornish part of mining waste and contamin rivers contaminated by mining waste. Is that something specifically that you're looking at as well with this project? Or are you even avoiding rivers because you don't want to encourage people to wade through contaminated rivers or regularly have to sample them? Yeah, it really is a balancing act. And it's the same with kind of highlighting sewage pollution. We've got the, the health and safety side of the organization that we don't want people out in the water, you know, when there's, there's mining runoff or heavy metals or, or where they know there's a sewage field. But at the same time, we do want to be collecting that information. And we also obviously, the, the, the public and our volunteers want to be collecting that. So what we're doing at the moment is um, me and my team are updating our citizen science investigations model to become something bigger, more of an um, all-encompassing volunteer offering where we're creating catchment-based communities. Um, so, uh, you know, using the, the biggest rivers of the West Country, we'll create a community within that um, who get the training, get the resources, get some funding from us, and then, you know, as many of the kind of, as much equipment as they need. They cover the basics that I've talked about today. So things like phosphate, turbidity, um, total dissolved solids, but they also use that local, local knowledge to decide what they think is most relevant to them. So whether it's mm -hmm. mining, whether it's sewage, whether a lot of the time these days it's people looking to um, get their stretch of river de de designated as a bathing water. They kind of have the power and the autonomy to decide what their focus should be. Um, and then we are the platform and we kind of empower them to do so. Um, we've got a really amazing community in PAR that are, that are a really good example of this. Um, and the, the PAR stream has phosphate readings that are, well, I've never seen phosphate readings that high before. So we measure phosphate um, using our colometric chart in parts per billion. The average West Country uh, river is kind of around 100 to 200 parts per billion. Um, I'm not sure about here in Falmouth, but our drinking water in Newquay is about 2,500 parts per billion the PAR stream regularly runs between five and 10,000 parts per billion. So on the colometric chart, the water goes dark blue instantly. It's horrific. Um, and the initial thinking was that that was because of sewage overflow. So we measure phosphate because it's indicative of either a mass farm runoff or a sewage spill. It can't tell you what's happened, but it tells you something has happened, which is obviously the, the citizen side of citizen science. Um, so the, the, the past citizen science group were out every week, it turned out, collecting this data and you know, finding these horrific results. And they thought, it's Southwest Water, we're gonna pin it on Southwest Water. So they were going to the local sewage outlets, they were measuring upstream and downstream, and they found that there was no difference. It, it, it was the same upstream of the, of the outfall as it was downstream. Um, you know, and they realized it was an issue. So what they're doing now, this is an ongoing campaign. They're working with or working alongside Imaris because they now think it's that English China clay runoff. So they've highlighted this issue. They've 
um, decided that it's, it's relevant to them and it's local. They've used our resources and our knowledge to kind of, you know, to, to pinpoint it. They've thought they found the, the, the culprit. They've, they've, you know, obviously done all the tests, realized it isn't and pivoted, you know, to try and find it. So the model moving forward will be that the local knowledge is, is key to it, you know, so I guess people on the, the Red River around sort of Hale and Red Roof, you know, mining runoff will be will be key. So we can work with them to get the relevant information and knowledge and relevant equipment to test for that and then sort of track that back upstream. Yeah, really cool. Thanks. Great. And then right in the back went up for something kind of talk to you first. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> Lovely. I've got local knowledge of Pembroke. And there's um, not just Pembroke, there's lots of marshy parts. So a question might, I'll raise my voice, um, raise other questions about how um, we can deal with the marshy bits and strengthen them. We've got a particular area I know is blocked in now, but was a sewage outlet and we have a real problem going down river. And it was, even as the news broke yesterday in the packet, it was happening under our eyes all the time. And we got swans, we got lovely things. Going on, um, I get a little confused in <laughs> language on the pyre, but um, lots of sea life going along there and it really concerns me but all this um it's about 30 40 swans in between different areas some of them come over from flushing we've never had that before as mm -hmm. our mayor said from further afield got the reservoir and there's particular points of interest that people are too interested in <laughs> um swan um has changed a lot especially with diggers and so forth coming on there and sadly we lost Candy Atherton, she she used to live along along there, and some of these people are hard people to replace. But hopefully, through our university and learning and conversations and trying to notify the authorities in a different way, maybe it's a setting where authorities can get interested because they're inundated with the local council with the same problems all the time. They can't cope with all this number, but if they had little settings to maybe see these films in community hubs, maybe that's a way to alert them and get more local knowledge again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like maybe that's one for the Cornwall Science community, but I think the public appetite for change is, well, higher now than it's ever been in my lifetime you know and I think having that support and having the university you know educated young people and having so many passionate people so focused on so many issues you know now really is the time for that and I don't think there's anything that people power can't solve eventually. Hi <clears throat> you from your charts you've be, you've got sort of readings going back at least 10 years, something like that. Um, I mean, ha can you, have you sort of got the trends together? Are things getting worse as the, um, you know, the, the, the sort of sea sewage situation is obviously getting considerably worse? I mean, what's your general picture? Um, it's really hard to tell with the data we collect because it is so citizen science based and our CSI program has only been going for six years. So, you know, in, and we need 12 months worth of data to, to um, create these scorecards and to give us that full picture. I think, and I think it's the, so my background was um, 10 years of surface against sewage, so kind of the, the bathing waters and that sort of thing is probably a more knowledgeable, knowledgeable about now rivers. I think, I, I can't say as to whether it's getting worse, especially over the last few years, but I think the public uh, awareness and how popular certain types of environmentalism are now. I think that's why it's so much more in the in the public sphere. Um, I remember being a kid in Port Town and, and or Port Treath and surfing and I'd be surfing in, you know, shit. You know, there the, would be raw sewage and I'm 32, so it's not that long ago. Nowadays, it's not that bad, but um, on the same note, I live in uh, Newquay and run Watergate Bay Surf Life Saving Club. I've run it for 10 years. I think in the last nine years, we've, not, we've had to cancel one session at Watergate Bay because of a sewage spill. The CSO is way upriver. This year already, we've had to cancel three. We've only been back for, for two months, you know. So 
whether knowledge is more readily available and understanding is there and it's more popular and that's why it seems worse or whether it genuinely is getting worse, I don't know. I do know, obviously, there's a lot more knowledge, there's a lot more data. Um, Serbs against sewage have their Safe for Season Rivers app, which is like a real-time thing. The Rivers Trust have their sewage map. Southwest Water have just launched their own one. So, you know, the, the, there's much more data out there. There's much more um, public support. And there's more famous people like Fergal Sharkey, you know, talking about rivers and, and sharing that knowledge as well. Cheers. Um, <clears throat> any more questions? No more hands put in place. How responsive are the building trade um, in connection with all the new housing projects that have been taking place around Farmouth in particular, especially in around the Swan Pool area, which increasingly gets more and more housing nearer and nearer to that extraordinary, you know, um, sort of a river and so on. Um, they're having problems, I know. They haven't put proper drainage systems in. In fact, I, I know from people who actually from, from plumbers and people who actually work on drainage systems, that domestic drainage systems already collapsed on some of these new bills because they haven't even done them properly. Um, but that, the impact of the, those, those houses, which are not particularly well built without proper drainage systems, domestic drainage systems, um, do the building companies actually take any note of what's actually happening within their environment? And if you point it out to them, how responsive are they? And what do they do about it? So there are, there's a whole sort of environmental criteria that all new housing estates and, and buildings need to have. Whether they're followed and if they're not followed, whether there's any kind of enforcement, I can't say. But all new housing estates have to have sustainable urban drainage. So things like um, a riparian buffer strips, so a minimum of a two meter you know, green area between any water body and the, the housing estate. There's uh, marshlands, like we've said, um, ponds, uh, to attenuation ponds, is it? Um, and, and things like that. It all, it, in the planning, it all should and has to be there. Whether, and this is a question I get asked at a lot of events, whether it comes, wh whether it actually happens and whether anyone is held to account afterwards, I, I can't say. I know in Newquay, especially, it's kind of um, quite well known that if you pay the council 30,000 pounds, you can put anything through land land sort of permissions um but even at the best of times if you think if, if they do everything right we're still using a victorian sewerage system so we're using a victorian system that was created for what 10 times less population than we've got now so even if they're doing everything right you know and the the storm overflows you know well all of the overflows kind of meet in that storm overflow and it's taking all the sewage away from people's houses and the storm overflows there so that it doesn't back up it, it's a system that cannot cope with the number of people that we currently have, and it would cost trillions to fix. In fact, I think Southwest Water have said that they're looking into it, and our bills will go up for the next 100 years so that we can fix the the um, the drainage system, the sewerage system. On that pleasant note, again. yeah. Sorry, this is all very <laughs> negative. People really can make a difference. It's just yeah, it's slow. <laughs> I love the idea. I uh, know a lot of that does plan and how it's expanded. And there will be, um, I know a lot of people that can do the workshops about things on um, rainwater. And if you were given maybe kits like your phosphate kits, those are the conversations, even if we don't get the other settings, that can happen there in the safe spaces with all aspects of community um we've got a lot of different types of gypsies and travelers in the heart of Raju. um lovely area in the middle literally heartlands that embraces lots of things lots of communities together and like you say the red rivers and yeah. there's fantastic programs that have already been on and highlighted um, the parts of Cornwall that are harder to get to transport wise, but that kind of like, um, while people focus on transport, that would also aid um, nourishing our rivers as well if we learn eventually more about, about it all. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, surface runoff from rivers is a big one. You know, we all know that we change our tyres when they wear down. You know, we all know that the, the rubber's wearing out, but but where it's going, what the environmental impact is, I think is still unknown. And I know there's a lot of 
environmental funders like Patagonia that have got big grants for people to look into the impact of sort of tire rubber in our ecosystems and how we can stop it. Like the same with um, uh, micro filters in washing machines. You know, we know it's happening. We don't really know what the ecological sort of effects of it are yet. So I'll take one more question from the room and then move on to an online question we've got as well. Um, how has the citizen science actually informed legislation and change? Um, it's, it's a really good question. I think it's probably the biggest part of the program that we do need to work on. At the moment, we're working closely with the environment agency. So going back to the, the, um, the slide I had earlier, you can see that they, they're just not monitoring anywhere near as much as before. Um, and the biggest reason behind that is sort of a lack of resources and a lack of capacity that they no longer have enough staff to go out and do it. So what we're doing with them is they know that there's whole sort of, um, well, tributaries, not full catchments, but you know parts of catchments that they have no data whatsoever and they know they're not gonna get any. So at the moment, we're working with the Environment Agency to kind of highlight these areas, and that's where we're actively recruiting for volunteers. So the citizen science data and the, the kind of equipment we use obviously isn't anything like what the Environment Agency would use, but it's better to have this level of data. And again, it goes back to having months and months and months done by the same person in the same position where the accuracy comes. They'd rather have that data than nothing at all. And then that data can then influence our, our more scientific teams to go out with, you know, the, the so this... A full CSI kit from us is about thirty pounds. Um, I think the the equipment we have goes all the way to like a full time, real time water quality monitoring sonde that's like fifteen grand. But if we've got volunteers out in an area that we know the environment agency aren't in, and you know phosphate readings are through the roof, they're, they're noticing continuous discharge from the the outfall. That's when we can get our monitoring team and our scientific equipment and implement it, and then the environment agency will start to take note. Um, so the EA are really receptive, obviously, because I guess the need for volunteering is due to a lack of resources and capacity they have. But they're really keen that we work with them to pick these areas where they know there's no data and to send our volunteers out. Um, the, regular, the water bodies like Southwest Water are less inclined to work with us, I think it would be fair to say. Yeah, I'm surprised that this is only, just come, like, this is only a question now. But basically, one of the projects I work on is uh, it's called CASCO. So it's the Catchment Systems Thinking Cooperative. Um, and it's off what innovation funded. Um, and basically, uh, the, it's run by our Rivers Trust, who are our kind of national governing body. They picked eight demonstration catchments across the UK. And within that, they paired up a Rivers Trust, um, the Environment Agency, or, or a, reg a relevant body, and a water company. So for us, it's the Tamar catchment, um, and it's us, the Environment Agency, in Southwest Water. And the whole point of our demo catchment is that we reach a point where the data we're collecting actually gets fed into the models that Southwest Water are using so that in their next funding round, they'll target the areas that we're finding um, problems. It doesn't sound massively hopeful because it's working for Southwest Water, I'm seeing some shaking heads, but you know, they're con it, basically they've got a lot of money, we've got a small amount of money, but we've all signed the same contract. So we're all held to at least trying to find that. And the meetings we've had with the meeting we've had with them so far has been relatively positive um and i think we're happy to compromise you know i know this sort of information isn't going to influence them but if we can reach a point where we're slightly increasing the the scale of the equipment we're using um, and obviously they're slightly lowering their expectations there's no reason we can't meet in the middle even as an indicator so you know we're using a couple of levels above what where we're at, at the moment we find a problem they then send down their team rather than obviously looking for funding straight away like there's no reason we can't reach a compromise while we work to that kind of more perfect solution. Again, it's a, it's a long process. Yeah, so um, Jim lives um, near the Carnan River and he says that the stream has been contaminated for years, particularly during heavy rainfall when it gets very smelly. And part of the stream runs from Gwenup Church to under the United Downs dump. And he's interested to know whether the problem lies with the dump or with the historic mining activity. And I suppose that's maybe a wider question of what impact do dumps, whether they're mm. legal or illegal, have on the river systems? I think, again, it goes back to that kind of overpopulation scale that, you know, well, landfill on its own isn't, isn't the solution. And the, the population size we have is, is, is never going to be contained. I imagine it's a, a range of issues. Um, without having that data, I don't know what the one thing is. And this is where our citizen scientists come in. You know, if we had um, someone testing, you know, right at the source and then all the way down these rivers. So there's someone above the mine, someone down below where the mine leakage will come in, someone above the landfill site, someone below that, you know, that's where 
we would need that information. And a lot of and volunteers come to us these days, as I said, and say, there's a sewage outfall. I know it's discharging. I'm going to monitor downstream of that. And, and that's great. But without knowing what the water should be above stream, you know, we just we, we couldn't pin the blame on on Southwest Water or whoever it is without having the, the sort of full range of data. Um, so, yeah, it's all about more people, more people out there monitoring and more data. There was another point I had to that. And I've heard it. Sounds like you need to sign him up as a volunteer. To yeah, definitely. Sure Please do. My email address is on the screen for anyone that's interested. Yeah. And we discovered the alibi had healing properties and it was a radiographer was talking to myself about that. So nurturing algae and collecting data on that would be fantastic as well. Yeah, absolutely. And so as I was saying, one of the things that we ask our volunteers to do is kind of that ecology, ecology score. So, you know, noticing, well, in this case, invasive non-native species or algal blooms or anything like that, you know, so we start to build a picture of what's there, whether it should be or shouldn't be. And then obviously our, our more sort of scientific team can look into what it is and what it does. Um, I remember my point from before. So in terms of the, the mine and the leachate, if you ever do think there's a sewage spill or these days even kind of a, a mass plastic pollution crisis, the best thing to do is always to phone the environment agency. So they've got a pollution hotline, which is 0800 80 70 60. Um, and as with all of this, the more you phone, the more likely they are to pay attention. So every time there's, you know, there's runoff on, on around Gwenapur, around United um, Downs, just phone the environment agency. The more you do, the more you bombard them, the more likely they are to, to pay attention and to send somebody out for that. Cheers. We're rapidly running out of time as well, so I'm going to prioritize people who haven't asked questions yet. And um, if anyone else um, had another one. Yeah. Oh, no, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have time for both. We don't take too long. Yeah. Just on a, a trying to get a more positive note, on the salmon um, uh, situation, when you mentioned before, trying to improve the rivers for uh, salmon, has there been any monitoring of that? Has there been an improvement in um, salmon spawning? Do you know? I don't actually know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I think that is something they definitely would do. <laughs> I would have to, I could definitely get in touch with the guys who go out there and do that work and get back to you. My, I've, I've got my email at the end, and if you email me, I can get you. Yeah, I'm sure we do have any. Only. Uh, not from that. One of our citizen scientists, so um, on the cartographer program that I mentioned earlier, basically you submit your data and it, we get the back end and we have to approve it. And one of them I was reading earlier was that um, someone had gone down and done their CSI testing and seen salmon, uh, like salmon in the river that they had never seen in the 10 years they've lived there. Um, so very sort of situational, but a very positive story there. Yeah. Um, but no. I guess it's hard, yeah, whether they could say that later going, but I'm sure they're definitely seeing more in the spawning habitat for the to actually get there. Whereas they weren't before. So, yeah, but they're, I'm, I'm sure they'll have some kind of like actual report on this. So I can kind of do. <laughs> I know who to ask. <laughs> yeah. Great. I'll finally let Robin ask a question before <laughs> we wrap up here. Um, I'm not sure I heard you right. Uh, that you, in 30 years, you've gone from being a bunch of people with a sort of shared enthusiasm to an. an Substantial organization was it eight by 80? 80, 80, over 80. Yeah. That's what, I, that's what right. I thought. Firstly, that's pretty impressive. Uh, so, on one hand, how, did, how easy or how difficult has it been to get the kind of problems to develop? And if you were able to, where would you want to go next? What would you set your sights on as a more, an even more ambitious program? I think funding wise, it, it's a mixed bag. So the way we're, we're run is that all, so most staff are employed on a specific project that has that specific funding. Um, and some things like for me, citizen science and kind of volunteer engagement is a very hot topic. So it's quite easy for us to get funds. Um, for some of the other projects, I know that, it, it, you know, that especially the sort of very um, scientific or data analysis is much harder. So what, what I think we've become good at, at West Country Rivers Trust is 
writing funding bids that are successful, but then sort of using the funding to sort of spread across as much as possible, if that makes sense. Oh. Um, so before I started, I've only been with the trust since November. There was no uh, individual fund for citizen science, but there were so many other projects that wanted citizen science data. So it, like there were, you know, two, three percent from the bigger funds would, would come into a little pool. And that's what would fund CSI since I've started. And we've had, you know, I'm the first person working on it. I, we've kind of found it's relatively easy to do, but a lot of our funding still comes from EU. Um, so we've just finished the preventing plastic pollution campaign, which was like a whole interreg um, EU funded project. Um, and I think in water, which is another CSI kind of led one is, is EU. So for some things, it's really easy. For other things, it's much harder, but we're very good at making sure that the funding covers everything we need to do. Yeah, I think... I think it's because now we've left the EU, that's we're going to be moving a little bit more into like more fundraising type activities, but we haven't really had to do that as far as I also enjoyed a month after you. But um, uh, I've, I've heard like in the past, it's like, yeah, we've just done the funding for yeah, lots of new projects, and now that's kind of changing. So we will be starting more fundraising initiatives. And I think, in I think from what I've heard, the company really grew over that kind of. COVID period, I think. Mm. Um, they recruited a lot more. And I think because it started off with a group of just like scientists, they just, you know, they saw this one and couldn't think about how, you know, like content marketing and actually getting your name out there more was important. So there's been a lot of like push to make sure that there's a lot more engagement with people and that would create a lot more jobs as well. Um, and you see kind of our um, chief director of Lawrence, I don't know what's that. Chief exec kind of becoming more and more open to more of this outreach stuff and creative ways of getting people involved. Whereas I think before it was very like science heavy and it did, yeah, maybe there was some benefit to that. Definitely. And then I think in terms of the future, I'll speak for sort of volunteer engagement and CSI only. I, I want to get to this point where we almost take a step back and we just become kind of the enablers, the platform. You know, we've set up these, these catchment communities around the um, well, ideally national. It, you know, it would be amazing if the, the model that we're working on um, could be sort of franchised out to all the rivers trusts across the UK. But we give them the skills, the knowledge, the funding if necessary, the equipment to really target their, their specific, you know, issues, the, the local issues that they think they are. Um, and we are moving that way. So we're creating this kind of tiered volunteer system where the top tier are called river guardians. Um, and, you know, they get things like they'll get a uniform from us. They'll get extra training so that we'll train them in CSI. We'll train them in things like Riverfly, which is a kick sampling, another water quality testing um, method. Um, but we'll also train them to be the trainer. So then they can start recruiting from their own communities. They can start training their own communities. So rather than it kind of being West Country River Stress at the top and we, we do all of it, these communities have the power and we just become a platform to make sure you know, that what they're doing brings about change, you know, that they then have. So we're not a lobby, lobbying organization, but these individuals in these communities could be, you know, so they're the ones collecting the data. They're the ones, you know, doing all the work. They should be lobbying their MP. They should be, you know, lobbying Southwest Water, whereas we're more of the mindset that working with organizations from the inside will, will bring about that change, you know, but the environment sector needs all of it. And having the local boots on the ground, being a bit more activist and a bit more lobbying, I think is, is where I'd like to see it go. Great, thank you very much. So, yeah, thank you. Just to wrap things up, if you're interested in other activities we're doing at the Cornwall Science Community, we do have flyers up front, as are uh, flyers from the West Country Rivers Trust, so please do come up front uh, and grab them. And I believe Haley has another couple of things. Oh, great. Right. Yeah, yes. Just to wrap everything up. Yes, there you go. Yeah, no, we've got a river road show. If you are around any of these locations on the next few dates, we're kind of big part of our Green River to You campaign, um, which is because we work over all the West Country, but we don't necessarily get out of the force here in those little corners of our reach. We're making sure that we get into busy uh, towns all over the West Country and all the work we're doing and just connect people with rivers. That's the whole kind of idea of what we're doing. Uh, this summer. Um, so yeah, I guess the most relevant one to everyone here will be the Maturity Summer Market. We're doing like um, some uh, event for ID activities and a storytelling history of rivers, just really getting people like excited about them. Um, and obviously this is exciting actually about science, but some people who aren't might be more excited to learn about 
yeah, history and we've created so many things. So yeah, if you are around for these days, please do come along. And yeah, that was everything other than that. And please do, yeah, check our website out, um, sign up for the newsletter there, so we'll send information out about the um plant garden workshops and the upcoming uh optional hard work for a few then in CSI stuff as well. We've got a donate that's all on there. And if you have any questions and want to email me about getting the data for that salmon uh populations, please do have my email. But yeah, that's everything for me. Thanks for me. Thanks so much again, Brian. Thanks to all of you.